Hello and welcome to today. Today's Institute of Politics is a nonpartisan institute at the University of Utah. The Hinckley provides an array of transformative experiences for students through internships, forums, and classes. Hinckley forums seek to foster public discourse and civil debate on the most current and pressing issues, bringing in local, national, and international thought leaders. Thank you for joining us for our second annual Ethics Week. This year, we will be examining pandemic ethics. In crisis, the creation and implementation of ethical policy becomes increasingly urgent and difficult. The COVID-19 pandemic is no exception. Over the past year, COVID-19 has both exposed and exacerbated inequalities within our communities from housing affordability, employment opportunities, healthcare access, and beyond. This year's Ethics Week will explore the policy implications and possible solutions to combat these inequities with experts from public service, academia, and private industry. Ethics Week is presented in partnership with the Kem C. Gardner Policy Institute and the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative at the Eccles School of Business. The Kem C. Gardner Policy Institute prepares economic, demographic, and public policy research that helps Utah prosper. The Gardner Institute is Utah's preeminent public policy institute and a vital gathering place for policy leadership and thoughtful discourse. The Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative at the Eccles School of Business at the University of Utah is a resource for principle-based ethics education, serving students, educators, and the business community. The Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative was established in 2009 to deliver principle-based ethics education and reinforce the value of ethical business and personal conduct. Today, we will, we will be discussing the moral, the moral imperatives of health, creating equitable health care in Utah. Samplin Layson, Associate Vice President for Clinical Affairs and Chief Clinical Officer at University of Utah Health will moderate today's discussion. He is joined by panelist Dulce Diaz, Director of the Utah Department of Health of Health's Office of Health Disparities. Lisa Nichols, AVP of Community Health at Intermountain Healthcare. Dr. Jose Rodriguez, AVP for Health, Equity and Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Utah. And Laura Summers, Senior Healthcare Advisor for the Kemsey Gardner Policy Institute. We would like to thank our media sponsor, KCPW, for recording and rebroadcasting our forums as part of the Hinkley Radio Hour. And if you have questions for our panelists, please enter them in the YouTube chat. And with that, I will turn the time over to our moderator. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, ahead of time to the panelists for uh, contributing today. Um, I'm uh, honored uh, to be among this uh, group of, of subject experts um, and we're going to be talking today about the pandemic uh, and um, uh, the specifically the, the pandemic's effect on uh, healthcare and disparities in healthcare. Um, I'm going to start with a question for Dr. Rodriguez. Um, COVID-19 is uh, is biologically a discriminatory disease, affecting different bodies very differently. Older people. Uh, people who are already sick for some reason uh, tend to do more poorly when it, with it. In, in what ways has COVID-19 also been a socially discriminatory disease? What social segments of our society have been disproportionately affected and, and why is that? Well, thank you, Dr. Finlays. And that's a tough question that has lots and lots of uh, unpacking that we'll need to do. You're absolutely right that it's biologically discriminating. It hurts older people more. It hurts people who have chronic health conditions more than others. And that's all biology. But really what we're talking about here is this, the intersection between uh, biology and social structures. So when we look at uh, who has been affected the most, we usually focus on four different race ethnic uh, populations. And we can talk about them in Utah, which is the black population or African-American population, the Latinx population, which is Hispanic, Latino, however you wanna say that, the uh, Pacific Islander Native Hawaiian population and the American Indian Native Alaska, Alaska Native population. I mentioned those four populations because at different points during the pandemic, they have each led either the infection rate or the death rate here in our state. And you think, well, wait a second, that's not biology. There's not a biological difference between the races. We know this. However, there are social factors that make the resources and the reserves 
more biologically difficult to access. So let's think about our uh, native population, our American Indian pop population, the largest uh, nation in, in the United States borders is the Navajo Nation, which does have land in, that is part of the Utah borders as well. And in the Navajo Nation, when COVID arrived, it spread like wildfire for lots of reasons. One of them has to do with how we live, right? Because sometimes people live in multi-generational households and some people who are asymptomatic can bring COVID home and get it. And people who are more vulnerable can get sick. So that's something that happened there, as well as lack of access to medical care. I mean, large sections of the Navajo Nation lands are considered frontier. So not a lot of access to many, many health services, uh, some as basic as food and water, some as complex as hospitals. And so that also has an effect. And so for a, a few weeks, months actually, the Navajo Nation led the United, the United States in per capita death rate. At the beginning of the pandemic, the Latinx population in the state of Utah also led <laughs> the state in per capita infections. Now this is probably for a different reason, but it also is the intersection of biology and social structures. For example, when we had our shutdowns, there were people who still had to go to work. And a lot of those people were part of the Latinx population. And what happened? They had to go to work. And if they didn't go to work because they were sick, they were at risk of losing their jobs. Now, I don't know how uh, other people think about this, but as far as I'm concerned, if I got to go to work sick or lose my job, I go to work sick. I have to feed my family. Okay. And so a lot of that happened as well. And so you found people having to make that impossible choice between protecting the population and protecting their own interests. And so lots of people ended up having to go to work sick. Some of them were sick and they knew it. A lot of them were sick and they didn't know it. And then it spread like wildfire through these uh, factories and places where people had to work close together. And that, that also drove the infection rate. The infection rate also uh, nationwide among our black population, our black population still has the highest death rate from COVID-19. But it has to do with the intersection again between biology and social structures. You know, young people did better in COVID because they had more reserves. They were healthier. And if we think about how adverse social uh, problems actually affect our health, then it becomes pretty obvious why it was that our black population had such a high death rate. And that is because oppressive, systemically anti-black racist structures affect life in toxic ways. That reduces reserves and it makes it so bad outcomes are more likely. And it also makes it so uh, vulnerability to infection increases. But it is not an inherent biological feature of our black population. It is a feature that developed because of toxic stress. And I can't, I can't talk enough about that. Well, and we, will, we, will, we will be moving on to, uh, to talk about racism a little bit more uh, detail. But before we move on to that, I'd, I'd like to ask um, uh, Dulce, Laura, and Lisa, if you have anything to, to add to uh, what Dr. Rodriguez just uh, uh, brought up. Okay, let's go to the next question. This one will I'll, I'll pitch to uh, to Dulce Diaz. Um, speaking of of racism or or systemic racism, it's been it's been declared a public health crisis by the major healthcare systems in <clears throat> in Utah. First of all, what is systemic or structural racism, and how is this manifest in our social institutions, um, and how does it affect healthcare directly and create disparities in access to healthcare? Great question. 
Um, first, we need to understand that systemic racism is not about individual behavior. Systemic racism is about how the system is created. Um, systemic racism um, focus on the ways in which societies foster discrimination through mutually reinforcing inequitable system. Systemic racism exists because discriminatory practice, practices in one sector reinforce parallel practice in other sectors, creating interconnected systems that embed inequities in laws and policies. Consequently, education, employment, housing, credit markers, healthcare, and the justice system mutually reinforce practices that allow or encourage discriminatory beliefs, stereotypes, and unequal distribution of resources. This system affects health through a variety of pathways, including increase um, to environmental exposures at home and at work, um, targeted marketing of unhealthy products and substance, including unhealthy food, tobacco, alcohol, inadequate access to healthcare because many um, of our, the communities that experience these um, systemic racism do not um, work in, in jobs that uno, do not offer healthcare. Maybe also because of immigration status, they do not have access to healthcare. So, uh, really, when we talk about systemic racism, we need to think about systems. We need to think about policies and practice. And this is something that we do not solve with just a cultural competence training to, to healthcare providers. Uh, because again, individual behavior is something, but when we talk about systemic racism, we really need to focus on the way um, our system operates, and we really need to target policies and practices in our organizations. So, so really, it's about the way that the way that our that our institutions are structured are stacked against certain populations. Not that it not that somebody is intentionally um, being racist, but that the way that things are structured disadvantages specific populations, and particularly those that uh, uh, that have historically been discriminated against. Is that? Yes, yes, and it's also about uh, uh, the power imbalance that exists between different segments of the population. We have one segment of the population making the decisions for other segments of the population without those segments being involved in the decision-making process. So systemic racism is also about power imbalance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any, uh, any further comments from other panelists on that particular uh, question? Sam, this is Lisa from Intermountain Healthcare, and and uh, completely agree with everything Dulce Dulce said, and also think about this just as a, a paradigm shift and how we think about uh, the contributors of health, and also how we think about equity. Um, you know, our, our mission at Intermountain Healthcare is helping people live the healthiest lives possible, and part of that mission is providing excellent healthcare. Um, but we, we know, uh, it, you know it's very apparent to us from, from the literature and from experience that health is more influenced by the conditions in which people live uh, than it is by actual healthcare access. So I, I think it's uh, you know, required by us as healthcare providers to think about the more complex drivers of health, to think about whether or not someone is in a safe environment whether or not they have stable housing, uh, whether or not they have access to uh, healthy foods. Um, and you know, we're, we're not in the position at Intermountain, for example, to become uh, you know, experts in housing, but I, I think it's really required for social services and, and healthcare uh, you know, to work together differently in the future. And um, we have great experience connecting that work through the use of community health workers, but, but to think about all the drivers of health and get beyond healthcare access. Uh, and, and part of that is that shift also in, in how we think about this work. Um, you know, as, as we think about equity, uh, we think about really reaching to someone where they are um, and meeting their needs in that place they are. And, and a really simple example is, um, you know, if, if we were outside and, and it was cold and, um, 
And I said to, to each of you, I'm going to give you a, a coat because it's cold and I'm going to give you that coat and it's going to be sort of my size. And some of you could wear it and some of you couldn't. But if, you know, if we got to equity and actually to justice, we would understand your size and what you needed um, and sort of meeting you in, in those needs. So I, I think the question really requires going beyond just the, the more traditional definition of healthcare. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And I think that's interesting in talking about um, the way that institutions perpetuate um, uh, discrimination or racism. You talked about things that you uh, experience yourself within, a, within an institutional context and questions that you have to run through. The, the next question, which I'll, I'll ask Laura uh, uh, Summers to address first, is that you know, while healthcare leaders are calling out systemic racism as a public health crisis, should the healthcare leaders be looking inward a little bit more? And, and in what ways are, might systemic racism be manifest in healthcare itself? Yeah, this is a, a great question. And I would certainly, I'll, I'll respond initially, but I think uh, Lisa and uh, Jose are very well equipped to respond to this question as well as they're sort of it within the healthcare systems and uh, Dulce, uh, given her great experience as well. So, you know, to me, it sort of manifests kind of in two different ways. One, I think there's just the unconscious bias that maybe providers have, that healthcare systems in general have, where again, they're not being actively discriminatory, but they're bringing their own sort of cultural background, small groups, um, and really aren't connecting or don't have the cultural competency or don't even maybe sometimes have the linguistic ability to connect with their patients and to really understand uh, where their patients is coming from, from a cultural background, from a linguistic background. And sometimes there is that very concrete language barrier that just creates an inability to provide care to a patient. Um, we've done a couple of different focus groups on, on different studies, more related to mental health, but that is always something that comes up just in terms of a barrier, in terms of being able to provide care, is that there's just not enough providers in the state of Utah who are able to Culture, provide culturally and linguistically appropriate care to their patients, um, which I think can really uh, break down some of those barriers. On the other end, you know, there definitely is um, active discrimination. And I think uh, Dr. Rodriguez is getting to some of this in his initial comments as well. Um, the U of U recently published um, a little sort of newsletter that pointed out that there's more than a hundred studies that have linked racism to adverse uh, health outcomes. Um, just the experience of uh, having race in it, racism in your life, experience racism in your life, really can induce that long-term stress that leads to those chronic conditions. And again, if you're not getting appropriate care uh, from your provider, you know, to deal with that toxic stress and why that is impacting your uh, conditions, it can be, you know, just create that that cycle of moving forward. So. Um, and then, you know, relating it back to um, COVID-19 a little bit, I think the silver lining was, you know, the increase in the availability of telehealth services and just the expansion of people who are able to access telehealth. But again, we need to remember that there are segments of our state, there are segments of our community that do not have access to broadband internet, that do not have access to telephones. So even though we've done uh, a little bit in terms of expanding access through telehealth, and again, you know, one silver lining that emerged from COVID-19 was really pushing that expansion, but we still have segments of our population that just do not have access to those types of services, so. That's a that's a really good point. I mean, it's it's fairly it's fairly clear that we have disparities uh, in in health uh, that are that are socially determined. Um, that we have structures that uh, that aren't built to um, to address those uh, disparities uh, directly. But let's let's talk a little bit more specifically about the pandemic. And this is something you just touched on. Uh, this question of <clears throat> of the the jump to telehealth um, was a pandemic specific. Uh, event uh, that that made the existing disparities even worse. Um, what other ways have has the pandemic um, made the situation worse in terms of uh, of disparities in access to uh, affordable or, or high quality healthcare? So um, there's a lot to unpack here as well. I think that it's important to recognize that when we're talking about healthcare systems 
and systemic racism, there, there's, there's a tendency to kind of look at it as something that we inherited, which is true. We've inherited all these systems. However, we also have to recognize that each of us plays a part, all right? So there's intentional stuff, there's accidental stuff, and then there's systemic stuff, all of them being essentially anti-Black racism. And the point that we should remember is that it doesn't matter to the victim if it's systemic or if it's individual or if it's accidental. The intention does not matter. It does not affect how much it hurts. It doesn't affect how much damage it does. And so the telehealth thing was a big one that kind of exposed uh, d disparities, right? But the other things is you think about uh, the health conditions that are prevalent in the Latinx community. We'll just use that one because I'm a member of that community. Think about diabetes, for example, and think about obesity. We are talking about a population that has a majority of the adults that are obese, all right? Over 50%. We're talking about a population that has among the highest prevalence of diabetes and the highest prevalence of uncontrolled diabetes. And those things also made it worse. So because of the social factors that led to this disparity in health conditions, we then had the pandemic on top of that, making it so social conditions where they had to work, where they couldn't uh, stay home if they were sick, where they didn't know if they were sick, those kind of things, on top of the fact that there was already different problems with their health actually made it so that these, the disparities were worse in the Latinx population. And for a long time, they were the, the most affected in our state. That of course has changed, but still they're more affected far more than the population would, would uh, dictate. The other thing I wanted to say about telehealth is it's fascinating because you know our partners at Intermountain, our partners at the University of Utah Health, we have mechanisms to do telehealth, but the mechanisms that we have aren't a, a lot of times available to our new American population, our undocumented population, our populations of color. And at the risk of making a plug, you know, I haven't met a patient that doesn't have WhatsApp, okay? However, you can't use WhatsApp for telehealth. So it was even more frustrating because it was so close and they couldn't get the care. So let's, let's move to a little bit um, <clears throat> more of a, of a positive uh, note. I mean, I think that we're, we've uh, identified a lot of the, of the challenges that we inherit and perpetuate uh, with respect to uh, disparities in access uh, to care and disparities in health. Um, but at the same time, you know, the, the pandemic has been an incredible learning experience, at least from uh, the perspective of our, of our health system in terms of what we can do better uh, on a lot of fronts. Now, I'd like to ask the question of what have we learned uh, from this pandemic about how, how government or the private sector or healthcare might be able to better safeguard equal access to, uh, to healthcare in, in time, and particularly in times of crisis. What, what has been done that's been effective uh, and what, what more could we do? Dulce, maybe you take that from the, from the state perspective. Yes, um, so um, a very important component from a public health perspective um, has been the, the prevention component, the testing. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we tried to avoid the collapse of our healthcare system. We have many of our vulnerable communities going to the hospital, um, inundating emergency rooms and the intensive care units. So through um, intensive work on testing, we were able to detect and also prevent the expansion of, of COVID. Was this perfect? Of course not. Uh, but we do not have a pandemic um, every single year. We have a pandemic once every 100 years. So um, the lesson that we have to take from here, um, we need to work more towards prevention because um, we need to have healthcare, but the healthcare assistant is very expensive and uh, it's much easier to prevent a disease than to treat the disease. So I think that that's the big take from this pandemic. 
if we work towards prevention and to have um, healthy communities, um, we will do much better in healthcare because, um, and it will be much cheaper for everybody. So that's, that's my, my takeaway from, from this is like, let's focus more on prevention and less on treating um, you know, diseases because if we prevent, um, we will have less sick people and our healthcare system will work better and everybody will be healthier and happier. Laura, from a uh, from a policy perspective, uh, what's what's the role of public policy in um, safeguarding equal access to uh, to healthcare, particularly in times of crisis? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think it has everything to do with safeguarding health. I mean, unless you have the policies and the the rules and the regulations um, to back up the sort of behavior change and the system change that needs to happen, it's not gonna be sort of longstanding. Um, you know, it's kind of going back to your previous question about sort of the private sector and government. I think, you know, there's um, within the private sector, I think this pandemic sort of sped up a little bit of uh, the interest in the health and well being of employees within the private sector. You know, I've, we've done a lot of research on mental health at the Gardner Policy Institute. And so I'm kind of coming at it from that lens. But, you know, you were starting to see a growing number of, of companies really being interested in how do they improve, how do they protect. Uh, the, the health and well-being of their employees. So I think we need to make sure that that continues. I also think that we need to make sure it extends to all sectors and all populations. Um, again, we probably heard that from maybe a subset of employers, but we need to make sure that that's all employers uh, within that are working with all populations and all sectors within the state to make sure that they are having that same mindset and understand why it's so important. Because um, they really can be one of the the primary drivers of change if it's coming from the private sector, you know, rather than uh, consistently relying on the government for that. And then with the government, you know, um, and policies, I think it's just important, you know, there, we could dive into a million different policies that could be implemented. But I think for me, the biggest thing is knowing that we, we just simply cannot go back to the way things were before. And certainly, you know, progress was being made, um, but we need to not, I know everybody's so excited. I get in this mindset sometimes where you're like, I am just so excited to get back to normal. I'm so excited to get things back to normal. But we need to remember that normal was not okay for a subset of Utah's population. And going back to normal is just simply not okay uh, for, for those populations, for those people. Um, and that we really need to use this opportunity where we have this light shed on this issue and these inequities that existed long before the pandemic and make sure that we continue to work to improve those. So Lisa, um, working at, uh, within the, the health system at, uh, at Intermountain, mm -hmm. um, what, uh, what kinds of adjustments uh, did Intermountain have to make uh, when it was recognized that, there, that the, the pandemic was exacerbating some disparities uh, to access to high quality healthcare? Yeah, thank you for the question. And Sam, I'll, I'll couple it uh, with the previous question about what can public and private uh, sectors do together? Um, because I think one of the adjustments that we made statewide and that we can be very proud of as a state is that we put together structures that allowed us to have very regular contact with that one another and to move very quickly. Uh, Dulce reference testing, uh, the same is true around vaccinations, the same is true around communication and social determinants of health that uh, we put together structures where we were able to meet uh, weekly, ev even multiple times weekly. Um, it took us a while, but you know, a very foundational piece was the data to be able to understand by segment what was happening in our geographies, to be able to uh, understand uh, what was happening um, in our multicultural communities. But once we had that data and we could watch it, we could act on it. So, you know, we at Intermountain were always uh, wanting to understand what the gaps are and where we could uh, be additive. And, you know, one example is, you know, we, we would be reached by communities um, who, you know, for very good reasons, maybe didn't trust the health system as much. 
and they weren't going to come to one of our facilities for testing. Um, but they would go to a trusted partner, right? Uh, they, in in the, a community-based organization in their community. And we have a mobile testing van. We were able to take that mobile testing van to that trusted partner, um, provide those clinical services in a place and uh, along with people who, who spoke their language, who were trusted. Um, so, so that's one example. And I, I referenced earlier also uh, the work that the Utah Department of Health has led around community health workers really identifying uh, individuals who are more vulnerable and having a community health worker reach to them around, you know, what, what, what are their housing needs and does a gap in employment as you're socially isolated mean that your housing stability is threatened? Um, and, and so, you know, again, because we were in regular communication with the Utah Department of Health, uh, Intermountain was able to understand um, when that CHW program was threatened and to bring some additional resources. So, but, it, but I think what was key there and what I hope we don't lose post pandemic is that very regular connection, looking at data and real time problem solving and adjustment. Thank you. That's a, uh, one of the points that you made there uh, was striking. It, it, it's uh, the, how much people trust a health system. Uh, and I think that, mm -hmm. That to some degree, the health systems uh, need to take some responsibility uh, for the trust uh, that they engender in different populations. Um, I, I recently uh, saw uh, an article that shows some statistics uh, in differences in different populations' willingness to accept a vaccine. I mean, all the story was mostly about this massive gap between white Republicans and white Democrats. There was also a significant difference between different uh, racial populations as well. Um, which uh, probably reflects to some degree uh, differences uh, in trust. So how do we, how do we better engender trust uh, in populations that, uh, that, that face disparities in access to care? So um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll take that one on, Dr. Finlayson. I really do think that the pandemic really exposed the whole trust issue and as a person of color working in a health system, I think that I have a role in trying to bring other people of color to the health system for care. But at the same time, there's things our health systems need to do to actually make it so that we start to earn trust again. I just read a paper talking about how really having our black and brown uh, healthcare providers out in the front lines doing this work is a workaround because it, it helps to try and bring people in, but it doesn't fix the fundamental trust issue. And the way you fix the fundamental trust issue is the same way you fix the fundamental trust issues in your personal relationships. So when I do something that is bad to my wife, brother, sister, whoever, my very first thing that I have to do is recognize my role and apologize for it. And apologize in a real way, not in a way that says, ah, oh, I was trying to do this, but nothing that makes an excuse for me. I'm sorry, I was wrong, we're not gonna do it again. That's what I have to do in my personal life. Our health systems have to do the same thing. I'm sorry, we were wrong. In this pandemic, what we should have done was, we noticed early on that there was a high infection rate in the Latino community. We need to go in there, start putting people in hotels and isolating people and paying for their work so that they could be able to get healthy and not spread disease. But we didn't go in with that because that's not fair because we're only, we're, we're giving one population more than the other. And that's the other admission that we need to do is we need to admit that our view of equality is not correct. We need to admit that equity, giving people the right size coat is what's gonna help the entire population. Because if we give the wrong size coat to me and I get pneumonia, I can spread it to everybody. But if I have the right size coat, then it's not just me who gets protected, it's the entire population. And so 
that's one of the systems, one of the things that we can do to re rebuild trust, apologize. The second thing we got to do to rebuild trust is to figure out a way to make it so people who don't feel like they're a part of the system can participate. And there's some good ideas about this. Some, uh, some places have developed specific health plans for people who are working and who can't get it through Obamacare for whatever reason. I guess it's called Biden Care now, and they can't get it through their employer for whatever reason, a health product for them. Other places develop things like sliding scales that are useful and meaningful for them to get in. That builds trust. And then the other thing, and Lisa was excellent in when she said this, is using and participating in material ways with community partners. Not just saying we're gonna partner with you, but I'm gonna provide money, resources, people to you to help you reach these communities. And I think that's how we rebuild trust. Any other comments from other panelists on, on trust? I will add to that that um, a very good example that we have is um, a community collaborative that uh, we have created at the Department of Health uh, with um, different community-based organizations with um, local health departments where we have funded community health workers positions to target and racial and ethnic minorities statewide. And has been a great collaboration. We have been collaborating with the, um, the University of Utah Wellness Bus and also now um, Intermountain Foundation is, is, is funding the project. So this is an excellent um, example of how we need to work. When we work with our community-based organizations, they are partners in the project. We don't tell them what they have to do. Uh, we have like a, a reciprocal conversation. So we are learning from them and they are learning for us. I think that that's key. If we want to address um, inequities, we need to involve our communities from the beginning, not just when we already have everything in place and say, hey, I need you to do this. We don't solve inequities just translating documents or putting like a Latino of a black face in, in, in a flyer. We need to involve the communities from the beginning. And that's a way, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, we need to empower the communities so they feel that they are in control and that's where we, we, we can move forward. Uh, we cannot reduce disparities, the health disparities. The disparities are the outcomes, but the inequities are all the process that creates those disparities. And in order to address those inequities, um, involving the communities, our community partners um, is key. Thank you. We're going to we're going to be opening this to questions in about five minutes. So uh, uh, if you're uh, if you're listening and you have a, a question you'd like to address to the panelists, please uh, please submit it. I'll have uh, I'll have one more question and I'll and I'll send this to uh, to Dulce and then we'll and then we'll go to the questions from the group. Um, so the when the, Hallelujah, we have a vaccine or a number of vaccines, uh, and we're seeing numbers drop uh, probably from a combination of our public health measures behaviors. Uh, and the vaccine on top of it. When we rolled out the vaccine, uh, the first limited doses went to the healthcare uh, systems to administer to the healthcare providers to, to keep the health system from collapsing. Um, and then the Department of Health um, took center stage uh, and started a population ad, uh, vaccine administration program, uh, starting with the biologically most susceptible uh, populations, the elderly, excuse me, the older persons, um, and as well as the um, as people who uh, have uh, uh, chronic diseases that, that make them more susceptible. Um, so Dulce, the question is, it, within the Utah Department of Health, what, what measures were taken or, or, um, or could have been taken uh, to address the, uh, the, the, um, the populations <clears throat> that were not based on biology, but rather based on uh, social circumstances um, at greater risk of a bad outcome from, uh, from COVID? And I'm very happy that you answered that question because we have developed um, a document that is called um, Striving Towards Equity, um, COVID-19 Distribution um, 
vaccine in Utah. So this is basically a list of best practices and recommendations for um, all the vaccine providers in Utah to comply with. Uh, the, this um, roadmap was presented by the Lieutenant Governor um, a couple of weeks ago, and it is expected that all the vaccine providers will comply with these best practices. Again, these are best practices and recommendations, and um, uh, we want all the um, vaccine providers to comply with that. Um, Maybe not 100% will do it because we do not have control over all the vaccine providers. Some of them have direct contracts with the federal government. So as a state um, health department, we cannot do anything. Also, um, local health departments play a big role uh, in the distribution of vaccines. Um, so what we are doing at the Department of Health, um, we provide like a prorated um, allocation of vaccines by local health districts and also we have a um, priority index that we have developed based on um, the social determinants of health in each specific geographic area. So that's something that um, we are following. Um, and again, um, equitable distribution of vaccines is really um, very important because it's not a matter of vaccinating 60, 65, 70% of the Utah population. It may be 90% of uh, one specific community has not been vaccinated. That's the reason for this roadmap uh, for um, equitable distribution of the vaccines. And that's something that we expect all the vaccine providers will comply with. Thank you. There's a, there's a question in the chat that is, um, that is, is somewhat related to the question that I just asked you, uh, Dulce, but it's more a, a broader question. What are your thoughts about the overall decisions that were made about distribution from an ethical standpoint, about who, who gets it when, um, the ethics of people jumping in line, you know, jumping the queue, um, traveling to different counties to get it when the, when the vaccine distribution isn't uh, even. Uh, any, any further thoughts, not specifically on the disparities, but in, in terms of the ethics of the way that we've made decisions about, uh, uh, about distribution of vaccine? So I think uh, I, I can say something about this. And that is that I think when we, when we have a limited supply, we have to triage, right? We have to get the vaccine to those who needed it first or needed it the most, right? Uh, when we got to this point where we were able to actually look at health conditions and the risks that health conditions uh, somewhat predict a bad outcome with COVID infection. That's what we've been using to actually vaccinate people. And one of the things that we've seen is that the science is pretty clear that, you know, if you've had a solid organ transplant, you're going to be vulnerable to a bad outcome if you get infected with COVID. So you need a vaccine first. So that's actually very equitable. The problem gets into the, the nitty gritty about race and ethnicity. Because when we look at those things, in some, some races and ethnicities actually have a higher risk of a bad outcome from a COVID infection than people with some of these chronic conditions. But for political reasons, race ethnicity was not allowed to be considered. And so we should really think about that as we, as we move forward. I, I don't remember if it was Laura or Lisa who said, we have to use data. And the data was clear that, you know, if you had uncontrolled diabetes and you were from X population, your risk of a bad outcome from COVID was less than if you were healthy and black. Yet there was no consideration for that in our, in our vaccine response. And we understand that there's political reasons for this, but I think when we're talking about ethics, we need to talk about that ethical dilemma because there was science behind it that was ignored because of a political reason. It's a, a challenging issue indeed. There, we have a number of questions in the chat about the, that reference the legislative uh, session. One of them asks, um, were there any initiatives that lawmakers took to, to tackle healthcare disparities uh, specifically? And another question 
And the chat says, um, or noted that in the recent legislative session, a, a resolution acknowledging racism as a moral and public health crisis was brought up and failed to make it through. Uh, do you think this type of resolution can help make a difference in health disparities? And so how do we get the state to acknowledge a topic which is often shut down quickly, um, end quote. So any thoughts about the legislative session that just concluded? Was there anything that addressed health disparities? And then more broadly, uh, what is the role of government uh, in, in addressing disparities uh, in healthcare, um, and specifically those that are uh, due to uh, systemic racism? And maybe we should start with our, with our policy expert, Laura. Do you want to uh, address some of those issues? Yeah, you know, I uh, I might have to punt on the legislative session. I um, nothing is coming to my mind that was specific, specifically addressing disparities, but I I would open it up to other people who uh, may have been follow, following that issue more closely. Um, you know, and uh, particularly the resolution, I, I do think it was great that it was uh, brought to, that it, all of our health systems came together and brought that forward. And I think that was a really positive action. You know, unfortunately it's, uh, it did not go through. So I, I do think, um, you know, more work needs to be done there just in terms of education. Um, and then in terms of sort of the policy, um, you know, I know there was a question that came through about sort of the federal government policies and their impact on Utah uh, disparities. I would just point out that we do have a new, we have a new state administration, we have a new federal administration. Um, so I do think there's going to be a lot coming out uh, or potentially a lot to be looking for in the next six to 12 months as sort of they, they uh, initiate and finalize and start moving forward with the policies um, at both the federal level and the state level and keeping an eye on what can be done um, and how to leverage those to help address disparities. You know, one that uh, comes to mind was just Medicaid expansion. And certainly that was an option under the ACA. Utah finally expanded. It was a long road, uh, but we finally expanded Medicaid. I would say, you know, fortunately just in time for the pandemic, but it's taking advantage of policies like that, that really increase access to the healthcare system. It's just one point of access, but certainly getting people insured and getting people coverage that they need um, you know, can, can go a ways in helping to reduce those disparities. So, Dulce, you're in, uh, in, in state government, um, and I imagine that you watched the uh, legislative uh, session uh, fairly uh, carefully. Was there anything uh, in the legislative session on a positive note or on a negative note related to, uh, to healthcare disparities? Healthcare disparities per se, um, I do not recall. Um, Health disparities, um, probably many of you are aware that the, um, the current administration, um, Governor Cox administration, is planning to merge um, the Department of Health with the Department of Human Services. So um, we see this probably as a positive move um, because um, the Department of Human Services target um, many vulnerable um, communities, the same way that um, the Office of Health Disparities and many programs of the Department of Health do that. So we see this as a very positive outcome that will really um, enforce the, the care overall that um, government can provide to vulnerable communities. So that was like a real, I think like a very positive outcome. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's a question here about um whether there are any lessons from other states outside of Utah uh, that have more diverse populations uh, than we have here in Utah. And are there things that we could learn from or apply here in our state uh, that, are, that are, have been successful elsewhere? Are you aware of any of anything that uh, comes to mind, Dulce? Well, I can tell you that the, um, the um, community um, collaborative that we have with the community health workers, um, has been replicated in other states. So other states are learning from us. And uh, that's really very, very excited that uh, other states are, are looking into the, the, the process that we develop here in Utah to target um, and address um, COVID disparities among and racial and ethnic minorities. And um, they are duplicating the efforts in other states. So I'm, I'm really, very happy to, for that. There's a uh, there's a question in the chat that's uh, that's a little bit uh, 
uh, tangential, but is a, is kind of a fun one uh, from a policy perspective. How is the state's legislature deadline on masks, April 10th, going to affect Utah's progress with COVID in your opinion? And are you worried? Lisa. Well, I, I was hoping that Dr. Rodriguez would speak as the healthcare expert, but uh, you know, I think uh, we're watching it uh, closely. We we do hope that people will continue to uh, socially distance and wear masks, and that we'll continue to be safe. Uh, we recognize that the. Um, uh, the recommendations we're using in the state are not completely aligned with CDC recommendations. So I think that really requires us, uh, you know, go, go back to data to, to watch carefully uh, if, if we're having increases in, in transmission and increases in death and to adjust quickly. And Dr. Rodriguez, I'd, you know, I'd lean on you as the <laughs> oh. physician here. I will agree with you wholeheartedly. I think, you know, we should really think about what worked in the pandemic, right? And what worked was wearing a mask, keeping seven feet apart, washing your hands all the time, staying home when you were sick and getting health care when you needed it. That's what worked. We have a vaccine now. And I was, I was fortunate. I got vaccinated in December. Okay. And I still never leave the house without a mask on because there's still no evidence or not enough evidence for me to say that I can protect people being vaccinated without a mask. And an April 10th deadline is a beautiful kind of hope inspiring message. But we should really look at this as that we are at the, you know, <laughs> that we're at the end of the beginning, okay? <laughs> we still have a long way to go. I was asked at another press conference, I said, so Dr. Rodriguez, how do you see the next six months of this pandemic with the vaccines out and everything? And I said, I see us wearing masks, staying seven feet apart, uh, washing our hands frequently, all of the stuff that we're doing now. Because if we stop prematurely, we are inviting chaos. So we can't do that. I also went to see my grandmother, who's 105 years old, who is also vaccinated and I hadn't seen her for a very long time. I didn't get close to her. I had to wave at her because the idea of making her sick made me so sick that I could not risk it. And it's that kind of love that we have to have for each other during this time. If we keep up our protective measures, then we are looking at a future where COVID becomes just a footnote and not the dominant issue of our day. Thanks, Jose. And I'm, I'm, uh, it'll be a wonderful thing when you can visit your, uh, your grandmother. That's a great uh, a personal touch. I will say on the legislative front, uh, I am worried, um, but on the upside, this will be, um, we will make history as being the first government ever to legislate the end of a pandemic. It's really quite remarkable if you think about it. Um, okay, back to, uh, back to disparities. Um, both Intermountain and UHC leadership have made a commitment to enhance and support healthcare equity. Can you name a few initiatives? So this one we'll, we'll send to uh, Lisa first and then to Jose. Thank you. Uh, Intermountain Healthcare has made equity both a fundamental and a value for us. And that means that it will be uh, an equity lens will be integrated in all of the work that we do. I'll offer uh, a couple of examples of initiatives, but just you know, want to be really careful to to not suggest that they're siloed initiatives. Right? There really is a need to integrate equity in all things. But a, a few things that we're looking at, uh, um, if if you look at our enrollment numbers in the state of Utah for children who are uh, Medicaid or, or children who are Latinx and American Indian, we have some very low rates of enrollment for children and families who are eligible. Um, and I think it goes back to the conversation that we were having about trust and the ways we engage our communities. So we really have our eyes on that to make internal improvements on how we identify people who might be eligible. 
but also to work in the community in a very collaborative pair agnostic approach. Um, I'll also uh, mention that we're working with our supply chain. Uh, you know, if, if we go back to the mission of helping people live the healthiest lives possible, uh, having people have well-paying jobs uh, is, is really a, a significant contributor to health. So we're looking at, can we change our local spend? Can we reach to local and diverse suppliers um, as our vendors and shift some of what we might be doing outside of the state of Utah? Um, and, and then we're, you know, we're looking uh, across all of our clinical service lines and, uh, and, you know, diagnoses and looking for disparities. And, uh, and, and we look at those disparities, of, of course, across race and race and ethnicity, but also across sexual orientation and gender identity and, and um, many other factors and, and then get very intentional around where we have disparities and how do we make improvements. Thank you, Jose. So thank you for that, Lisa. And I think there's a lot of the uh, things that are being done at Intermountain are being done on our side of the house as well. As you know, we are also an academic institution. So we have kind of a dual role here. So our service delivery line is run through our hospitals and clinics. What we've done is we've centralized that work and now we have a senior director for equity, diversity and inclusion who is going to be working on the issues that have to do with employees in equity and diversity and inclusion. When it comes to patients, this is actually done by our medical directors and our providers. So we look at our data, we see what it is where we need to improve and then we make targeted efforts to reach those communities. And so as we've been looking at it, some things are simple, like for example, mammograms. We know that the recommendations are pretty clear that women over 50 should get one every year or every other year, okay? And if we look at that by race ethnicity, we see that there's a disparity there. And so we concentrate our efforts on where the disparity is to raise the numbers. We still have to address the issue of trust though. Because until we address the, the issue of trust, it's going to be individual, one-on-one, -on -one convincing people. <clears throat> the other uh, point on the academic side is that, you know, we train future physicians and physical therapists and pharmacists and nurses, and it goes on and on, right? And so how are we going to meet the needs of, this, of our d increasingly diverse populations? not just the race ethnic populations, but the other uh, diversities that might be invisible. And so the way you do that is you change policy and you change policy to eliminate oppressive strategies. You change policy to be more accepting. You prepare students from these groups so that they can be competitive in the admissions process. And you change the admissions process so that it is no longer unfair to people from certain groups. And so we're working on all of those fronts to actually help increase the diversity of the pool of people that take care of our diverse patients. Well, we have, we have one minute left and there's, <clears throat> there is one particular population that is addressed in one of the questions in the chat uh, that, uh, that we haven't talked about much and that is the undocumented uh, community, uh, certainly a, a community at risk um, and, uh, and, and a community for which this matter of trust that we've talked about is, is critically important. Um, is it, this is perhaps a question for you, uh, Dulce, is it, is it possible that we don't have good data on this population because they have you know, been wary of, of coming forward even to get tested? Um, and could the problems with this population be even worse than we know? We have been working with um many of the community-based organizations that we are contracting right now work specifically with undocumented communities um, in the Hispanic community, in the Asian community, in the Pacific Islander community, um, in other communities, because we have, uh, when we talk about undocumented immigrants, it's not just about the Hispanic Latino community. So right now we are doing a big effort with our community health workers to educate individuals why it is important that they report the race and ethnicity and why we are using that data. So um, we are doing everything possible to track the, the race and ethnicity data. 
And within that, of course, we are not asking if you are documented and undocumented because it's kind of, we cannot ask that question, but we know um, for the community-based organizations that we are working with that we are actively targeting um, the immigrant undocumented community. Thank you. Well, we're at the top of the hour. I want to, uh, to thank uh, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, Dulce Diaz, Laura Summers, and, and Lisa Nichols for joining us in this panel. And, uh, and thank, uh, and thanks to those who have uh, who've organized and arranged it. This has been a really fruitful and uh, enlightening uh, conversation. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Finlayson, for a wonderful